This morning we're back in Genesis and perhaps to my wife's dismay we'll be doing two chapters and so we can catch up on being quote unquote behind. But if you're listening to this online you'll be able to tell by the length of the message if I was successful or not in getting two messages, two chapters in. But I think that these two chapters uh, flow together and work together very well. So the title of this morning's message is I am Joseph. I am Joseph in Genesis 44 and 45. Do you remember who else said I am, right? God said to Moses in the burning bush, I am, tell Pharaoh I am that I am. And Jesus said, I am when they came to look for him and they fell backwards. And I don't think Joseph is claiming his deity here, but I think that in his revelation of who he is, and this morning, just like Jesus revealed who he was in the Mount of Transfiguration, and he revealed to them on the cross, and he revealed to them when they came to arrest him, he revealed to them what his true identity was. He wasn't some king on earth, he wasn't just some teacher, but he was the king of heaven. And to Joseph's brothers this morning, he's going to reveal to them, well, not well, this morning when we read, it was a couple thousand years ago, but when he revealed to them who he really was, he was their brother. He was their brother. But again, uh, Genesis 44 and 45, and previously in Genesis we've seen Joseph's dreams. Remember he had the dream about the wheat and the stars bowing down to him, and we've seen the famine come to pass. We've seen that these dreams started to come true, and his brothers hated him for it, and so they wanted to kill him. Reuben was going to save him and get him out of there, even though he wasn't happy with everything. He wasn't going to let his brother be killed, but Judah ended up selling him, selling him off into slavery to the Ishmaelite traders. Remember that Joseph went to serve in Potiphar's house. He ended up going to prison, wrongly accused, and he served in prison. He interpreted dreams there of Pharaoh's servants and later was remembered and, and ended up interpreting Pharaoh's dreams himself about the feast, uh, about the famine that was to come. Uh, remember the seven years of plenty, the seven years of famine, uh, and Joseph was put in charge of all of Egypt. He was under Pharaoh. There was only Pharaoh who was more powerful than him. But now, as we'll see, there's two years into the famine. The seven years of plenty are over. There's five years of famine left. And the brothers go once to get grain. And we see that Simeon was kept there. And they were told to bring Benjamin back. Their money was returned. Remember that message, their hearts failed them. That'll be important at the end uh, of our message this morning. But remember that they returned again at the last possible moment. They didn't want to deal with it. They didn't want to face it. It was their dad who said, guys, you have to go or we're going to die. And so they went and they brought Benjamin. They feasted with Joseph. He sat them in birth order. He gave Benjamin five times the portion. And it confused them. How on earth could this guy know that we're all brothers and that we fit in this line like this? And said that they made merry, that they were having a feast. And that's, that's where we left off as we're about to pick up this morning. And I have a couple of questions. And maybe they make sense in the message. Maybe they don't. But does your life make sense right now? Maybe these questions don't make sense, but does your life make sense right now? Are you merry or are you overwhelmed with problem after problem? Sometimes we go through life and all of a sudden things start to go good and just part of you goes, you know, you forget all your problems and then you start to realize, well, we're not completely out of this problem yet. We're making merry, but we're still in this guy's house and we're not really sure what's going to happen. No matter what you get in life, are you still empty? Are you famished? Maybe that's too on the nose with the famine, but sincerely, we can have everything in our lives where we don't have a, a physical famine. We have enough food. We have money out the wazoo. We're going on vacations, doing crazy things. But spiritually, maybe we don't have it. I've read about uh, famous people as of late who are done with life they have everything in this world fame fortune money power respect and yet they find themselves spiritually dead and looking for an answer looking for jesus even and this morning lord as we get into your word let us look for you let us see you and not miss you and god more importantly would you reveal yourself to us in it God, your word says that if you were to hide yourself, we could never find you. And Lord, you make yourself plainly visible in the things of creation, God. So let us look to you and trust you 
And God, would you fill us with your spirit and minister us in your word, all those who are listening in your church all over the world this morning. May you, you be revealed and not hidden. May you be lifted up and not missed uh, for who you really are, God. You're our father and our king, but in a sense, you're also our brother. He took on flesh for us and became like us, and we might know you and be forgiven and brought to heaven. So we thank you for that, God. May you be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to take uh, these two chapters in pretty decent-sized chunks. We're going to split 44 into, into two spots, pretty much where the, your Bible may actually split it. So we're going to read the first 17 verses together, and then we'll talk about it. Genesis 44, verse 1 says, And Joseph commanded the steward of his house, saying, Fill the men's sacks with food, as much as they can carry, and put each man's money in the mouth of his sack. Also put my cup, the silver cup, in the mouth of the sack of the youngest, and his grain money. So he did according to the word that Joseph had spoken. And as soon as the morning dawned, the men were sent away, they and their donkeys. When they had uh, gone out of the city and were not yet far off, Joseph said to his steward, Get up, follow the men, and when you overtake them, say to them, Why have you repaid evil for good? Verse 5, Is not this the one from which my Lord drinks, and with which he indeed practices divination? You have done evil in so doing. And so the steward overtook them, and he spoke to them these same words. And they said to him, Why does my Lord say these words? Far be it from us that your servants should do such a thing. Look, we brought back to you from the land of Canaan the money which we found in the mouth of our sacks. How then could we steal silver or gold from your Lord's house? With whomever of your servants it is found, let him die, and we also will be my Lord's slaves. And he said, Now also let it be according to your words. He with whom it is found shall be my slave, and you shall be blameless. Then each man speedily let down his sack to the ground, and each opened his sack. So the steward searched. And he began with the oldest and left off with the youngest, and the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. Then they tore their clothes, and each man loaded his donkey and returned to the city. So Judah and his brothers came to Joseph's house, and he was still there, and they fell before him on the ground. And Joseph said to them, What deed is this you have done? Did you not know that such a man as I can certainly practice divination? Then Judah said, What shall we say to my Lord? What shall we speak, or how shall we clear ourselves? God has found out the iniquity of your servants, and here we are, my Lord's slaves, both we and he also with whom the cup was found. But he said, Far be it for me that I should do so. The man in whose hand the cup was found, he shall be my slave. And as for you, go up in peace to your father. So we see that after the feast, Joseph told his steward to fill up all of their sacks as much as they could carry. You know, they've only got one donkey eats, they've only got certain size sacks, but pack it in as much as they can. Make sure that they get everything that they need. He also returns the money to them, and he also sneaks his, his special cup, his, his cup, you know, uh, I don't know if you remember, what was that Indiana Jones? where they have all the different cups and they try to figure out which is the cup of a carpenter and the one lady picks the wrong one and she dies and then the other one picks the right one, it's the wooden cup. Uh, but this, as a ruler, he has this special cup um, and they put it in Benjamin's sack. Benjamin's sack, the youngest one. Again, showing some favor to Benjamin, showing that Joseph is picking out the youngest one on purpose. It's not just randomly in there, right, Timmy? But this cup was a silver cup, and it was, uh, at least in their culture, to practice divination, to observe signs, learn by experience, diligently observe, practice fortune telling, you know, take as an omen. There was some witchcraft related uh, with these things in the past, and people would, I don't know, maybe they would drink and get drunk and serve things up, or maybe they would use the cup and look in the swirling of the cup. Uh, You know, the Bible says, don't be enticed by the swirling of the wine, right? Um, and again, like in the commentary, we know that uh, it, said, it talks about other sources of ancients that they use these things. Uh, it says it's possible that Joseph did also because there is not a specific word from God. But I, I don't see Joseph doing that. I see Joseph loving God and worshiping God and being able to interpret dreams from God and just being in their society, but not of it. And so he has this cup, and it might be a cup that someone else might use for divination. It's a symbol of his spiritual power, of his power of being able to interpret dreams, even though Joseph knows that it's God who gives him the interpretation and not he himself. 
but he uses this symbol, this thing that they might look on and see him as an Egyptian, his symbol of the spiritual authority in their life, to put it in Benjamin's cup. To show that Joseph is in tune with something spiritual that the others are not. And so I think that that's more of the sign of what it is in his life. But he puts it in there. He tells his servant to do all this. He tells his servant to let them go and then eventually catch back up with him a little bit later. And essentially it says that when they come back that he, they find him still at the house. He's still there. You know, he was out at the granary every day making sure everyone got the dispensary. But today, with a special plan going on, Joseph hung back. You know, I don't know if it was Saturday and they had off or something, but I think he was hanging back. He says, to tell them, why have you repaid evil for good? Like, I have done so much for you. Why would you steal this from me now? Last time you had all that gold, all that silver in there and the money in there. And now you're doing it again. And not only that, even after feasting with you and I give you all this, you take my cup. Joseph was really trying to put them through the ringer. He was really putting them to the test. And I think the steward saw that too. The steward knew that they didn't steal it. But the steward was playing along. The steward was making sure that whatever Joseph wanted said was said. And isn't that important for us? Even if we know what's going on in someone's life, we know what's deal that we tell them what, uh, what God has told us to say, right? But what does Jesus say in Luke 6, 27 through 36? He says, but I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who spitefully use you. To him who strikes you on one cheek, Offer the other also, and for him who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who asks of you, and from him who takes away your goods, do not ask them back. And just as you want men to do to you, you also do to them likewise. But if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those to from whom you hope to receive it back, what credit is that to you? For even sinners lend to sinners and receive as much back. But love your enemies, do good, lend, hoping for nothing in return, and your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the unthankful and evil. Therefore, be merciful, just as your father also is merciful. And I think we could spend a lot of time in these verses and talk about the parallels with Joseph's life. But Joseph is being good to these men who have been nothing but bad to him. And even in this testing, he's being kind to them. And he says to them, I've done good to you. Why would you do this evil? Why would you repay my good for evil? And if you think back to his youth, did he really do them anything wrong when he was a kid? I'm sure he was kind to them. I'm sure he was nice to them. And they did what? They repaid him evil for his good as a kid. And sometimes we blame God and we get mad at him when we are tested in life. And he will certainly allow us to be tested. But God is not the tempter. When temptation comes, it's part of the test. But God does not want to give you temptation but he will allow you to be tempted but not more than you can bear the scripture says the brothers didn't know what was in their sacks let alone benjamin's they didn't check this time you think that one of them might said let's check just to make sure you know sometimes you go to the store i bought the wrong extension cord yesterday i got home i i saw one nice one i think i was looking for another one to see if they had a cheaper one and i went back and i must have grabbed the wrong one i got home i was checking the receipt to make sure i wasn't double scanned for anything and i saw that it was the wrong one i'm like i'm definitely returning this because it's way too expensive you think that you know going back that they would check their receipt so to speak that they already were troubled last time let me figure out what's but they don't they don't. They go on. Maybe they're a little hungover in the morning. They get on the road. I don't know. But they had no idea what, that they didn't think anything was in their sacks this time, let alone Benjamin's. And so they defend their own goodness. But I think they go a bit too far this time. Because in verse 9, they say, With whomever of your servants it is found, let him die. And we also be my Lord's slaves. So whoever took it, we, we were saying so much that none of us took it, that if we did have it, just kill him. And let the rest of us be your slaves. You know, maybe this is Reuben speaking up again. If you remember Reuben, when he got home the first time, he's like, Dad, you take my kids. We'll kill my kids if I don't bring them back. And I don't think he said it the way I just said it. But sincerely, Reuben, if this is you, let your yes be yes and no be no. And, and don't say with rash words 
what's going on here. Don't we do that in arguments sometimes? We try and qualify ourselves further than we have to, and it always comes back to bite us. So did they not remember last time? Did they not remember the promise to their dad to protect Benjamin? And now they're potentially putting him on the chopping block. I saw this video the other day, it came up in some feed, and then it wasn't on YouTube, and I saw it on YouTube. But it was this, this guy who's on trial, and he looks like a rough character. He's got tattoos all over his face. He just, he looks rough, and perhaps on some sort of drugs. And he's before the judge, and he's pleading his innocency, innocency that he would never do X, Y, Z to his kids. And so the judge asked him, you know, he looks like he's being someone honest, but you know, you can't tell you. I haven't seen the rest of the trial. And the judge asked him, what sort of sentence should the person get who did this to his children? If you didn't do it, when we find that person, what should we do to them? And you see the guy kind of hesitate for a minute, like realizing he might be putting himself in a trap here. And he kind of, not as boldly as he proclaims his innocency, a little as boldly, he begins to say that they should have no mercy, basically the worst punishment, life. I don't remember exactly what he said, but basically a life sentence. And so the judge says, so-and-so, I can, you're convicted of these things and you will have a life sentence. That's pretty strong, right? I think the judge was pretty wise in that sentence where he said, all right, if you're innocent, what should we do to the people who did this to your children? And he uses the man's own words to get him because the man obviously wasn't remorseful. He wasn't repentful and so repentant. So, But the difference here is that the brothers aren't guilty. They didn't steal the silver. They didn't steal the cup. And so they speedily take down their sacks and they find it with Benjamin. It's interesting, they don't pay mind to the money that's returned again this time, that the, the, the thing that they're really concerned about is the cup. And perhaps they thought everything went well with Joseph and he was blessing them this time with the money again. Or perhaps it was just because the stakes were higher. And again, I think it's because that this cup in some way was a sign of Joseph's spiritual insight or perhaps his even spiritual authority over them. Like he says to them later, you, didn't, you thought I wouldn't be able to divine this? I wouldn't be able to figure this out? That it was you guys who took my cup? I mean... I don't know that you need to be a spiritual guru if you have a bunch of people over your house and it's one party of people and they leave in the morning and your silverware is missing or your wallet's gone. It doesn't take a magician to figure out that you took it, <laughs> but they didn't take it. But I think it's interesting anyway. And so what do they do? They tear their clothes. No, no, no. And this was something common in in Bible times, a sign of grief to, to tear your clothes in anguish. And Judah here, it says, uh, Judah and his brothers in verse 14 that they get back, when they get back to the city, I think Judah is taking lead of the family again, just like he did when they left the last time. Maybe it was Reuben who was speaking up before, and Judah's like, oh, I gotta lead this family again. We gotta go back. They gotta go somewhere they don't wanna go again. But verse 16 says, What shall we say or defend ourselves? They could say they didn't take it. They could say that it wasn't theirs, but they don't even do that. In a sense, they're taking the blame for even this happening because they say that God has found them out for their other sin. They're, they realize how guilty they were from their childhood. From their, well, it wasn't really their childhood. It was Joseph's childhood. But that God had found them out, that their sin would find them out. And the Bible says that your sin will find you out. You can't hide it. You can't cover it up. Eventually, it will be found out. And Joseph says, you know what? I'm not going to enslave you all. Just give me the one who took the cup. And the rest of you go home to your dad. Just be in peace and get out of here. And again, I'm, I believe this is a, a direct reflection of what they did to Joseph. Will they take care of the youngest? And this time Benjamin. Will they take responsibility for his safety and for him ultimately being sold as a slave? They're selling him as a slave. Or will they allow him to be taken away that they can go free? Joseph was taken away and they went home free. Will they be able to go up in peace to their father again like they did after they sold Joseph? Will they say, all right, well, you know what? Benjamin's the youngest. We don't really care about him, but we'll be okay. We did it before. We got away with Joseph. We lived the rest of our lives. We had family. We had kids. We've gone on for these couple of decades, and we've been able to live life and get away with it. Are they going to do that again or no? And that's what Joseph, I believe, is, is here to test them for. 
And let's go on and read uh, the rest of this chapter, 18 through 34. It says, Then Judah came near to Joseph and said, O my Lord, please let your servant speak a word in my Lord's hearing, and do not let your anger burn against your servant, for you are even like Pharaoh. So Judah's like, Please, just let me, just, if I can speak, just let me speak a minute, please. My Lord asked his servant, saying, Have you a father or brother? And we said to my Lord, being Joseph, We have a father, an old man, and a child of his old age who is young. His brother is dead, and he alone is left of his mother's children. And his father loves him. Then you said to your servants, Bring him down to me, that I may set my eyes on him. And we said to my Lord, The lad cannot leave his father, for if he should leave his father, his father would die. But you said to your servants, it's interesting that they keep saying servants, like they're keeping humble to him, bow down to him, even the words they speak to him. Unless your youngest brother comes down with you, you shall see my face no more. So it was when he went up to your servant, my father, that we told him the words of my Lord. And our father said, go back and buy us a little food. But we said, we cannot go down. If our youngest brother is with us, then we will go down, for we may not see the man's face unless our youngest brother is with us. You know, Benjamin was their access to Joseph, access to food. Without it, they couldn't get in. Then your servant, uh, my father, said to us, You know that my wife bore me two sons, and the one went out for me, and I said, Surely he is torn to pieces, and I have not seen him since. But if you take this one also for me, and calamity befalls him, you shall bring down my gray hair with sorrow to the grave. Now therefore, when I come to your servant, my father, and the lad is not with us, since his life is bound up in the lad's life, it will happen when he sees that the lad is not with us, that he will die. So your servants will bring down the gray hair of your servant, our father, with sorrow to the grave. For your servant became surety for the lad to my father, saying, If I do not bring him back to you, then I shall bear the blame before my father forever. Now, therefore, please let your servant remain instead of the lad as a slave to my Lord, and let the lad go up with his brothers. For how shall I go up to my father if the lad is not with me, lest perhaps I see the evil that will come upon my father? It's interesting, Jude doesn't say that, well, you know what? We sold our brother to slavery and we tricked our dad. So he, he doesn't confess to Joseph. He, he carries on the story of Joseph being eaten up. But the point of it is saying that, look, my dad and my brother, like, please, like, these people, just take me instead. And it's interesting that Judah is the one who goes near Joseph because he was the one who sold Joseph. And he's the one who pleads. And he recounts all that happened to them that got them to this point. They remind Joseph of the words that he said to them the last time he was there. And I believe that's a good way to pray at times, is to remind God what he's promised us. Remind God what his word says. Not that God's forgotten it. It's not for God's sake, but I think for ours. I think sometimes we get a, he'll give us a better understanding of his words to us if we repeat them to him. Go, oh, that's what you matter. Oh, Lord, I know I can trust you now because I've reminded you about it. Not that you'd forget, but I, can, I know that you and I have talked about it, and this is a point that we can hang on. And so Judah reminds Joseph that if anything happens to Benjamin, their dad, Jacob, or Israel, will die. And he says that his life is bound up in him, and I love this saying. His life is bound up to him, that Jacob is so in love with his son, Benjamin, that his whole life is bound up in this little boy, who's a bigger boy at this point, but his whole life is in that. If something happens to him, what is he going to live for now? His wife is dead. His favorite wife is dead. He's, he's old. Joseph's already been taken away. You know, and I think, man, you know, how much more would my life be bound up in my remaining children if one of them had passed away? But are our lives bound up in those that we love? I don't mean in a bad way, in some codependent bad way where you devour each other, where you're so dependent on someone where you know, it's unhealthy, but I mean in a good way. And I don't mean in favoritism here like Israel. I mean for our children. If you have kids or there's children or family members or loved ones in your life, if anything happened to them, would it bring us down to the grave or could we continue on? And I'm not trying to say that like if you lost a child and you're continuing on in life, how dare you? I mean, you know... <laughs> Do you do anything and everything possible to protect them? And not in an unhealthy way again, but sincerely. And not again for the drama of self-pity. 
I'm so caught up in the life of my children, but to a point where you would do anything and everything for them. And sometimes we say that, but we won't spend time with them. Sometimes we say that, but we're unwilling to train them up in the way they should go at every cost. But it comes to a point where the school system teaches them such awful things, are you willing to take them out of that? If the Lord would so lead. And will you die for them in every way, even if it means actually dying for them? And I think as parents, most of us would say that. Yes, of course. But it's sad to say that not every parent is a good parent. Like that story I shared about the man uh, in court being tried and convicted. He was the very opposite for his children. I'm sure he did that, that his life would continue. But we see here Judah, he is now willing to lay his life down and take the place of his brother. He would save Benjamin, even though before he wouldn't, he sold Joseph, right? And he would do it for his brother and for his father and for his whole family, I believe. And we remember that Jesus is the lion of the tribe of who? Judah. It was not Jesus' willingness to sacrifice similar. That Jesus died for his father's sake, his father asked him. He died for his brother's sake, in a sense, for us as humanity, but also for his whole family's sake, for all of humanity's sake, for his, the, the nation of Israel, for us, for Gentiles. And Judah says, because of the evil that would come upon my father. I believe that this is a recognition in, in his mind and heart that all this happening to their dad, even before and even now, is evil. That their actions affected others. That his sin, to try and do what he wanted to do, get rid of an annoying brother, make a few bucks, just get rid of him, affected his dad. And it was truly evil. That their sin, and you're in my sin, is really evil happening to someone else. That when you and I sin, we don't live on an island. That we wonder how evil happens in this world. Evil happens because people sin. And it might seem like it's good to you. You're stealing from someone, right? And you're getting all these riches and you're getting everything you want. It doesn't hurt you. In fact, it makes life better for you, so to speak. Physically, but not spiritually. Spiritually, you're dying. But what is that sin doing to someone else? That sin is evil happening to someone else. Someone else got robbed. Someone else got beaten up. Someone else got cheated. And that's the evil. And this is what Judas says here to Joseph. Chapter 45, we'll read 20 verses. It says, Then Joseph could not restrain himself before all those who stood by him, and he cried out, Make everyone go out for me. So no one stood with him while Joseph made himself known to his brothers. So it's just Joseph and his brothers in this room now. And he wept aloud, and the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard it. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Does my father still live? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed at his presence. And Joseph said to his brothers, Please come near to me. And so they came near, and he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. But now do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For these two years the famine has been in the land. And there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. So he's revealing to them that, hey, the famine's not over yet. They, they don't necessarily know that. And God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me. Do not tarry. Can you imagine that? Like, think about that. This little, your father and this little boy, nothing to do with Egypt, is lord of all of Egypt. That's crazy. That's mind-blowing. We take the story for granted. This little boy is not, has nothing to do with Egypt, rules over the whole land. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near to me, verse 10, you and your children, your children's children, and your flocks and your herds, 
and all that you have. There I will provide for you, lest you and your household and all that you have come to poverty, for there are still five years of famine. Behold your eyes and the eyes of my brother Benjamin, and see that it is my mouth that speaks to you. So you shall tell my father of all my glory in Egypt, and of all that you have seen, and you shall hurry and bring my father down here. Then he fell on his brother Benjamin's neck, and he wept, and Benjamin wept on his neck. Moreover, he kissed all his brothers, and he wept over them. And after that, his brothers talked with him. Now the report of it was heard in Pharaoh's house, saying, Joseph's brothers have come. So it pleased Pharaoh and his servants well. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, Say to your brothers, Do this, load your animals and depart, go to the land of Canaan. Bring your father and your households and come to me, and I will give you the best of the land of Egypt, and you will eat the fat of the land. Now you are commanded to do this. Take carts out of the land of Egypt for your little ones and your wives. Bring your father and come. Also, do not be concerned about your goods, for the best of all the land of Egypt is yours. And we'll stop there for now. It says that Joseph couldn't restrain himself. That all this emotion, all of these years of praying and seeking and waiting and trial and trouble, and his brothers finally before him, and Benjamin, his little full brother, finally before him, he couldn't hold back. Those tears he couldn't hold back. You know, watching some 9-11 videos, you know, tastefully with the kids yesterday to teach them about it. I couldn't hold back tears at, at times. And my daughter Mia certainly noticed and she'd rub my hand. Um, but nothing compared to what Joseph was weeping, right? You remember, who else? Who else wept? For his brother, so to speak, his best friend Jesus did at Lazarus' grave, right? He wept. But Joseph kicks everyone out. He doesn't sneak out this time when he begins to, to lose his emotions. He doesn't sneak away from the table, go in his room and clean up. He kicks instead. He wants all the Egyptians out and he wants just his brothers before him. He wants this intimate time with his brothers when his heart is open, his heart is broken, and he needs to be able to share with them. And it says that he wept so loud, the Egyptians in the house of Pharaoh heard it. So obviously his whole house would carry through the house. Maybe even those outside could hear him weeping. Uh, you know, I'm sure they had open windows and it's hot in an air conditioning, right? Uh, and maybe Joseph lived near enough Pharaoh for Pharaoh to hear it, or maybe it just means that Pharaoh heard about it, like we see later that uh, it was told Pharaoh that Joseph's brothers were there. But Joseph says to them in verse 3, I am Joseph. Does my father still live? He reveals himself to them, and his first concern is for his dad. He misses his dad. He loves his dad. He was taken away from his dad. He, didn't, he had such a good relationship with his dad, and he hasn't been able to see him in so long. But his brothers couldn't answer them. Can you imagine? You're the brothers. You're here. All that's going on. You're, you're, you're in trial one minute for having the silver cup in Benjamin's sack. Judah's like, please, please, please don't take Benjamin. I, 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 take me instead. And then all of a sudden, the guy who you're standing for, the judge, the ruler of land goes, weeping and crying, says he's your brother Joseph. You never said the name Joseph. And now the name Joseph happens. Does my father still live? And it says that they're dismayed. I think on every level, like the definition says, disturbed, alarmed, terrify, anxious, afraid, nervous. I think in every level, they're like, oh my word. This is Joseph. What's he going to do to us? Are we off the hook or not? Like, this guy, we were afraid this guy was going to enslave us to begin with, and now he's the one that we sold, that we were going to kill, and he's got all this power over us? I think it's also like, what is happening here? I think it was also shock. This, this man all of a sudden breaking down, crying before them, goes from one minute to judging them, the next minute to crying before them. I think he's probably speaking in Hebrew at this point. He stops using the translator. And it's also, he knows everything we said. <laughs> he didn't need that translator. He speaks Hebrew. And so I think probably more calmly he says, come closer. Come, guys, come here. I'm Joseph, your brother. I'm the one you sold. It's me. Guys, it's me. And I love that he doesn't even take a minute, waste a minute, and he begins to minister to them. He says... Don't be grieved. Don't have hurt, pain, vex, resting, you know, because you sold me. Don't be angry with yourselves or with each other. Don't hate yourself. 
You've obviously repented. There's obviously been a difference. And even then, it has nothing to do with you guys. That God had a purpose in what you did. Don't fight each other. Don't beat each other up. Don't beat yourself up. That God brought me here before you. He just happened to use what you guys did to me. You know, God will use every situation. That doesn't mean that every situation is, is his will, and the world confuses that. The world blames God for every bad thing that happens. And just because a bad thing happens doesn't mean that it's God's will, but God will use it. You know, if God is a loving God, why would he let this happen? Like he desires something bad to happen. That's not the case. We're the ones, like Joseph's brothers, who desired the evil to happen and who make the evil happen. But even when we do, Timmy, God can use it for good, and he will. Because only God can take something so incredibly evil and use it for good. And this is a conversation I have with a coworker when he gave me a ride home. We were talking about abortion and cases of rape. And I said, well, why does the rapist, the one who did the evil, not get the death penalty? But the baby, who is absolutely innocent, does get the death penalty. That baby, even though an evil happened, right? That baby is still God's will. That baby is still has a great plan for their lives before the foundations of the earth and still has a maybe even greater opportunity to see how much their Heavenly Father loves them. And I'm not, I'm not trying to sugarcoat it and make it easy for any party involved. I'm not saying that, but what I am saying is why is the baby the one who's punished? But what's God's plan every time, as Joseph says? To save a life. Whatever is going on in the world, God wants to save a life at the end of it. If something bad happens, what does God want to use it for? To save a life. Joseph says that they are two years into the famine. There were seven years of plenty and seven years of famine. So we're nine years into this whole deal. In verse 8, he says, So now it was not you who sent me here, but God. The, the brothers feel the guilt and shame of sending their brother away to Egypt and slavery, and it's true. But God, Joseph sees, guys, you have no power over God. I'm the second in Egypt. How did that happen? Because of God. God is the one who brought me here to put me in this very chair of power. And can you and I really say this to those who have wronged us, to those who have sold us up the river, that it wasn't you who did this to me, but God allowed it for my good and yours. That it was for the good of even those who did the hurting. And we'll get to it in a couple of weeks, I hope. Genesis 50, 20. But this is a verse the Lord used to minister to me about my parents' divorce growing up and really just allowed me to completely forgive them of everything that happened. And even to say that, I feel kind of like, do I need to bring it up? Because I don't want to like make them feel bad in any way. But sincerely, as for you, Joseph says, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about as it is this day to save many people alive that God allows these tragedies to happen that he might save and it's not to sacrifice the one for the good of the many that's not the heart of God it's not this communist heart where the individual doesn't matter because the individual totally matters to God he'll leave the 99 to get the one right but first Corinthians 10 13 says no temptation is overtaking you except as common to man like I mentioned before but God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able but the temptation will also make the way of escape they may be able to bear it that whenever God we're faced with a test or a temptation or a trial in life God will always call us out with a place to go in mind just like even with Abram we don't know where it is or what it is or what the purpose is potentially yet God never calls us out to nothing. He will always have a provision ready and waiting for us if we but go. Joseph didn't call his brothers near that they could, he could condemn them, but instead he called them near that he might bless them. And that's the same thing with God. When God's spirit goes out in all the world to convict the world of sin, of judgment and righteousness, it's not that he might bring judgment on them, call them to court to be condemned, but to call them into God's courts to his garden that they might be blessed. 
And when Pharaoh finds out, this is a good Pharaoh. This isn't like the Pharaoh we're going to read about, well, you might read about in Exodus. This Pharaoh wants the Israelites there, wants Joseph's family there. And he respects Joseph in some sense, and he cares for Joseph. And he, 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 I'm sure he heard everything that Joseph said. Somebody heard it, and someone shared it with him, that Joseph's brothers are here. He knows that there's a famine, and Pharaoh is so blessed by Joseph that he says, bring your whole family here. He says, you tell them, get the carts, get the semi-trucks from Egypt, load them up, bring them back, bring the moving trucks from Egypt, bring them back to your dad and your families, bless them with all these gifts, and tell them to come here and don't care about the furniture, leave your flat screen TV, because I've got all the best in Egypt, and it's all yours if you would come here and dwell in the land of Goshen. That was an area in Egypt, in northern Egypt, east of the lower Nile, where the children of Israel live from the time of Joseph to the time of Moses when they leave. This became their land. Their little garden inside of Egypt that God would use to incubate them to become a nation. But it's interesting that the word Goshen, it means drawing near. Drawing near. This land, whether it was named that already or Pharaoh decided to call it that because his brothers and his family were drawing near. This is where they would be. And when we lived in, in New York, we went to a church in the land of Goshen. I remember years ago praying, God, do I stay at the church or do something else? And I remember getting, uh, I don't know, it was this verse or something else, but remember to stay in Goshen, right? But that's where we want to be with the Lord. We want to draw near to him. That's the land of Goshen for you and I is to draw near to Jesus. That's the place he wants us to live. If you have a question about where you want to live with God, live with him in Goshen, in the near land. Stay near to him. And that land may actually be called Goshen or it may be called Hamilton, Montana. And if you're listening to this message, it's for you. It's Hamilton, Montana. Pack your bags, come out here now, and you can come stay in my land, and I'll portion off a part of it and call it Goshen. You can live there. <laughs> half joking, but half serious. Maybe God has sent me ahead of you guys because something's going to happen in America, and you're going to need a place to go. I hope not, but get here before they do nuke D.C., <laughs> if they do. But China's getting uppity. Iran's getting uppity. This, America's not going to stay like this much longer. Even America can't even hold itself together anymore. Why? Because God was the only one holding us together. And I'm going to get off that soapbox for now, but believe me, you'll hear more of it one of these days. But Pharaoh gives them and gives Joseph, and he tells them to have all this safety, that their children and grandchildren, everything that they have can come there. All their concern for their families this whole time being in the promised land this whole time with the famine even, on top of that, their burden is being lifted. They're being cared for, and they don't even have to worry about their stuff. They just they pack up what they want, but all the best of Egypt is at their disposal. They've got a, a platinum card or whatever you call it uh, to go to Best Buy and go to Home Depot and get whatever you need to get. That they're gonna, Their lives, all in all, are going to be preserved and bettered in Egypt. Why? Because their relative there is a ruler. That's their only stake in Egypt is that their relative, their brother whom they sold into slavery and wanted to die, right, is a ruler there. And that sounds like a lot like a good deal, a lot like a heavenly place to me, a lot like the heavenly deal, where the only stake and claim that you and I have to heaven is not our good works, it's not our pedigree, it's that our brother Jesus, whom we sold into slavery, who we esteemed stricken, the Bible says, who we crucified, sits in heaven at the right hand of the Father. And the Father says, bring your children in. Let them come in. Don't worry about the things of earth. I will provide for you. Because heaven is what? Heaven is Goshen. Goshen is heaven. A being in the presence of God, a place to safely dwell with him forever. But heaven is better than Goshen. Proverbs 27, 23 through 27 says, Be diligent to know the state of your flocks. Attend to your herds, for riches are not forever, nor does a crown endure to all generations. When the hay is removed and the tender grass shows itself, and the herbs of the mountains are gathered, the lambs will provide your clothing, and the goats price of a field. You shall have enough goat's milk for your food, and the food of your household, and the nourishment of your maidservants. And that's what Pharaoh, like God, would say to the Israelites, I've got all your needs covered here. Just come here. Just come here. And that's what God says to you and I. Just come here. Bring your dad and all of his house. The best line. This is more than mercy. This is forgiveness 
and it's grace upon grace. Instead of being just as slaves or facing the death penalty, they're given the very best in all of Egypt. And is this not a picture of Jesus Christ and what he makes available to us on the cross? We deserve death, but what do we get? Heaven. The best of Egypt is yours. Don't worry about this life, guys. Instead, like Jesus says in Matthew 6, 19, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. 21, the sons of Benjamin... I'm oh, sorry, I'm looking at the way wrong chapter. Ooh. <laughs> Verse 21. Then the sons of Israel did so, and Joseph gave them carts according to the command of Pharaoh, and he gave them provisions for the journey. He gave to all of them, to each man, changes of garments. But to Benjamin he gave 300 pieces of silver and five changes of garments. And he sent to his father's, the father of these things, ten donkeys loaded with good things of Egypt, ten female donkeys with loaded with grain, bread, and food for his father and for the journey. And so they sent his brothers away, and they departed. And he said to them, See that you do not become troubled along the way. Then they went up out of Egypt and came to the land of Canaan to Jacob their father. And they told him, saying, Joseph is still alive, and he is governor over all the land of Egypt. And Jacob's heart stood still, because he did not believe them. But when they told him all the words which Joseph had said to them, and when he saw the carts which Joseph had sent to carry them, the spirit of Jacob, their father, revived. And then Israel said, It is enough. Joseph, my son, is still alive. I will go and see him before I die. It says, According to the command of Pharaoh. And again, when Pharaoh heard about all these things, and Joseph weeping, no doubt he inquired of it. But he blessed Joseph's family. And again, this is, in a worldly sense, even a good king. That this Pharaoh, that just because the other Pharaoh was bad, doesn't mean that this one was bad. Other than obviously he thinks he's God and he rules over Egypt and all that stuff, but you know, an unbeliever. But he was concerned about the cares of Joseph's heart. And I think about my employer and how they care about their employees and their families. That if your kids are sick, you stay home. You know, you work from home or take time, but it's not an issue if you need to take care of your family. I mean, you know, you might have to use sick time or whatever, but sincerely, family is paramount there. You should only get one family. You know, work is important. It's good to do good work and be good at it, but family is more important. But you see here that everyone gets a change of clothes. That Pharaoh makes sure that Joseph gives them everything, a change of clothes. And Revelation 6, 11a says, Then a white robe was given to each of them. And 7, 9 says, After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, palm branches in their hands. And this one I love in Zechariah 3, 3-5 through says, Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments, and he was standing before the angel. Then he answered and spoke to those who stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, See, I have removed your iniquity from you, and I will clothe you with rich robes. And I said, Let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head, and they put clothes on him, and the angel of the Lord stood by. That This was a sign that they were going to be new people, they were inhabitants of Egypt. They weren't going to wear their clothes of poverty, clothes of famine, clothes of the old life of sin, but they were all getting new robes. Joseph had the robe way before them, and they hated him for it. Now that they've grown and lived and seen that Joseph is in power, he wants them to have robes too. And I think that was Joseph's heart the whole time, to bless his brothers, to bless his family, that they would have such good favor with their dad like he did. And we see that Benjamin gets a ton of money and five times the clothes. Like the meal, Benjamin's getting incredible, favorable treatment from his, his brother, his full brother. I think in some sense, yeah, you know, it's his full brother. He's going to do that. But man, to have the favor of the Lord, it's, it's way more than you can ever ask or think or imagine, right? And Benjamin probably never could even count to 300 before, and now he's got all this money. But they sent 20 donkeys full of the best of Egypt back as proof of Joseph, of the blessing that these guys can never afford all this stuff, and they come back with truckloads of, of goods and riches for the journey. And what does Joseph say to them? He says, see that you do not become troubled along the way. He's ministering to them. Guys, I know you're troubled the last couple of times. We remember where you read the hearts fail them for fear, right? They do not become troubled along the way. And Joseph 
again, is showing his spiritual care for his family. That his spiritual authority doesn't give him a way to lord over his, his, his family, but he lords over them in the sense that he blesses them and cares for them and watches over them. He says, everything's going to be okay. Don't let your heart be bothered. I'm here to bless you, to love you, to care for you because of God. And after God forgives us and blesses us, I believe there's always a temptation or an attack of the enemy that tries to bring us down and bring us out of the blessing and back to the judgment. As we begin to go back to our normal lives and we've got boatloads of blessing, we begin to go, I don't deserve this. And that's true. But then you go, well, that must mean I can't have it. It must mean it's not real. But God doesn't want you and I to be troubled with the things that he's already dealt with. He wants us to move forward in our journey, even if it means going back for a day or two, to come back to him and dwell with him. And so they tell uh, Jacob that Joseph is still alive. And again, can you imagine being Jacob after all these decades, being old and weary and wondering what's going to happen to Benjamin? And they tell him, and it says that his heart stood still. Did it just stop? Like, you know, like sometimes... He skips a beat, so to speak, or did he actually have a heart attack? Did he have a heart attack? And he's laying there, Ugh! and they tell him, Dad, 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 Joseph's alive. We got all this stuff, and it says that his spirit revived in him. Did, you know, was that the defibrillator that shocked them back into life, knowing that they're going to be okay? You know, or was it just more figurative? I don't know. But can you imagine? Of course, it was overwhelming. He didn't believe them. What? What? Huh? Joseph, are you kidding? And this revived him. The news and evidence and the words of Joseph now being alive revived Jacob. I believe much like the resurrection. That when Israel, the nation, finally comes to faith in the Messiah and Jesus, their hearts, they will be revived. Their lives are going to be so fulfilled They've been living in famine without their Messiah, thinking that they can do good works, or maybe we can rebuild the temple, or if we just keep these things, maybe we'll be all right. But God promises that Israel's time is not up, that we have not replaced them because we have been grafted in. But unfortunately, I think from the, what the Bible shows is that the majority of Israel is going to take the tribulation to wake them up. Just like, much like here, it took the worst of the famine to get this family back together and into safety and salvation in Egypt. I love that Jacob says perhaps his heart started beating again and he's on the ground and you know he almost died and he goes, oh, it's enough. Joseph, my son, is still alive. I will go and see him before I die. Like, I'm close to death, but this is, you know, it's kind of like you say, like, I've seen, you know, I guess it was the old Looney Tunes. They would talk about, I guess I've seen everything now. Like, you know, they see something crazy and then they could die. This is Jacob. He's like, I, I could see my son Joseph again. I'm fine with dying after that. And my life is fulfilled seeing him back. And that's the heart of a father. And I believe indeed that's the heart of the father. And that was a whole point personally for his family to save them from famine, to reunite them in a way that it could have never been united before. Think about their family and how messed up it was with the different wives, with the sisters, with the brothers who fought, with the favoritism. They could never be this unified before. With all the flesh and all the sin and all the things, nothing would fix it. And that's because sometimes in life it takes a great undoing to put things back the right way. I've experienced in my own life when God has had to take things completely apart. I remember being in an apartment and there was mold in walls. We had to take everything out of the apartment, fix it, and then put it back in. And God was using that to speak to me about something else in my life. And if your life feels like it's undone, feels like it's in a tragedy, it's in a famine, know that Jesus has gone before you to make a way through it for you, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but by him. That Just like Joseph was sent ahead, Jesus was sent ahead of you and I. And won't you accept his offer to come be with him? To come have your spiritual and emotional and physical needs met. Jesus says, come to me, all you are heavy laden and burdened, and I will give you rest. Just come. That's all we have to do. We don't have to make up for it. We don't, I mean, we might turn around after that and try, but it's not for salvation. It's from it. But man, why won't we just come to him? 
the one who loves us. I think it's because, like the Bible says, if you don't, it's because you love your sin. It's because you love your wicked ways. That they love the darkness rather than the light. Don't love the darkness. The darkness hates you. The darkness is death. Come to the light. Come to life. Accept his offer of eternal life with him. To be with him in heaven. You get to enjoy all the benefits of heaven, of being a son, a brother, of God himself. It's all at your disposal. If you would just lay down your life, forget what's back there in the famished land, and hop on and go with him. And so if you're listening this morning, and you need that, turn to him. Say, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, I, I need you to be my Lord. I need you in my life. I need you to forgive me of all my sin, the stuff I'll never be able to make up for. It's all of it I can't make up for. It. Please wash me. Give me a new life, a new robe, so to speak, new clothes that I might follow you and serve you and, and come home to heaven with you. Thank you for dying for me on the cross. Thank you for being the way, the truth, and the life and for not hiding yourself for me allowing these things in my life that I might come to you and be safe and be saved for all time and eternity. Help me love you. God, help me to know the Bible and to want to give others the same coat that you've given me. I love you, Jesus. In your name I pray. Amen. If you've prayed that, you're going to heaven. Don't be troubled along the way. Turn to him, get involved in the church, contact us, talk to someone in your life who you know is a believer. And Lord, we pray that God, you would help us all go to heaven and continue to go. And for those who did pray that prayer, or those in our life who knew that prayer, would you help them, would you help us to lead them there like Joseph did? To lead them there like you do to us, like you did to us, God. If it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be here. And I thank you for that. Thank you for going ahead of me and for not treating me as my sins deserve. And God, may your word go forth today and in all the land that people might turn to you in these last days before you return. In Jesus' name, amen. May God bless you and keep you and his face shine upon you. There is a vineyard of the Lord. There is a vineyard for our soul. With all our troubles left behind the door, we drink first light until the door.